Our reading from the New Testament this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 28. And here's Paul speaking to the church there, which, by the way, would have met in houses. It would have been a small group. So, anyway, here's what Paul says. So, I'm telling you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. You shouldn't live your life like the Gentiles anymore. They base their lives on pointless thinking and they're in the dark in their reasoning. They are disconnected from God's life because of their ignorance and their closed hearts. They are people who lack all sense of right and wrong and who have turned themselves over to doing whatever feels good and to practicing every sort of corruption along with greed. But you didn't learn that sort of thing from Christ. Since you really listened to Him and you were taught how the truth is in Jesus, change the former way of life that was part of the person you once were, corrupted by deceitful desires. Instead, renew the thinking in your mind by the Spirit and clothe yourself with the new person created according to God's image in justice and true holiness. Therefore, After you've gotten rid of lying, each of you must tell the truth to your neighbor because we are parts of each other in the same body. Be angry without sinning. Don't let the sun set on your anger. Don't provide an opportunity for the devil. Thieves should no longer steal. Instead, they should go to work using their hands to do good so that they will have something to share with whoever is in need. These are the words of God for the people of God. Okay, so we have been talking all this month about church. What church is supposed to be about, well, doing life together with Jesus as our leader, as our head. In the first week we talked about how church is a body. Everyone is a part of it. Everyone is needed. And without, we just don't do, we just don't work right. When you are missing, something's just not right. When you're not here, you actually deprive everyone else of your essential part. Then, week two, we talked about how this meeting, this gathering, isn't just a a club, it's not just an organization um, like others. We are a family. We are children of God, adopted by God as His children, heirs to all that God has. Then last week, Paul gave us some additional, some extra word pictures to get get a, a, a really rounded picture of what it means to be a church. Um, citizens. We're citizens, a household, a building, a building, and that makes each one of us a brick. A brick that's lined up on the cornerstone so everything is straight on Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. That's our model. That's our direction. Um, And today, as we get into chapter 4 of Ephesians, Paul starts to get really practical. And so we get really practical in this doing life together. What does it look like? How do we relate to each other as the body of Christ, as the household of faith, as citizens? That's where we go today. You know, as for me, you know, this Christian life, it's hard. It's ongoing. It never ends. You know, when when I'm honest with myself, which kind of tells you that there are times that I'm not, um, I even cover up things from myself. Times when frustration gets the better of me and, and it leaks out. It leaks out in being short, curt, and sometimes angry. And it can be over stupid little things. You know, stupid little things like, 
I can't find something that I left and I put in a place that I wouldn't forget where I put it and I can't find it and the longer it goes, the more I look. The <sighs> and then sometimes there's that urge of just getting short with somebody because they're not doing their part. I, you know, or times that I feel like, and I know it's not true, but it feels like people are against me because they just don't agree with me. I know none of you have ever had those feelings. You know, and, and we live in a world where there's this constant barrage of what to think and what to do, especially in the way this world operates as a dog-eat-dog -dog world where you, it's survival of the fittest and that the idea of love, you know, the idea of love that lifts everyone, the idea of love that can transform, that that's just pie in the sky. You know, we live in an age of political correctness. You know, it's a time when phrases soften things that if you actually said what they were, we would be horrified. You know, like in the old Soviet Union, actually, yeah, Soviet Russia, um, where those who were not in favor of the government, who rebelled against the government, and especially Jews. You know, there were as many or more Jews killed in Soviet Russia than in the Holocaust. You know what they called those? They didn't call them people. They were former persons. In our own country, in our own country, how there were times when races that were not of our own were called by names that would make them inferior or lesser or even non-human. And how in so much of everything, it's us versus them. If I have, you can't. Or if you have, I can't. And, you know, it's a zero-sum, win-lose game. Class envy. Doesn't it? It mean, we live in an age of outrage. Because um, if you don't agree with me on any one particular issue, especially political, then that means you are evil. And we'll get into that whole discussion in our next sermon series. But here's the thing. In the midst of that, if Christianity, if following Christ is to mean anything, it has to mean something now. Why? Because the Scriptures truly talk about the change that comes over our new life with Christ that starts now. Not just an earn a trip to heaven, not a get to Christ so we can be taken out of this world, but because we're made new even now. So that's how we look at this passage from Ephesians. And we're going to ask three questions this morning. What was? What changed? And what's the result? Okay. What was? What changed? And what's the result? Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in Your sight. My rock, my redeemer, my friend. Amen. So first, what was? Paul said it like this. He said, you shouldn't live your life like the Gentiles anymore. That is, that followers of Christ should live differently from the pagans. They should live differently from people who don't have Christ. And, and what did Paul say about those who were not followers of Christ? What did he say about them? He said, well, number one, they're pointless in their thinking. They're dark in their reasoning. They, they have ignorance and closed hearts. Now, I don't know about you, but I often hear the charge that Christians are the ones that are not rational. That Christians are the ones that hate science. That Christians are the ones who believe in myths. Well, someday... Sometime, if you're really interested, we can get into in-depth examination. We call it apologetics. The rationality 
of belief in Christ. How belief in Jesus and His resurrection in the Bible is rational. It's supported by evidence. But for now, we're just going to touch on two things. Um, the first is that we've all heard it said from people is there's no such thing as ultimate morality. There's no such thing as ultimate rights or wrong. There is no such thing as ultimate right or wrong. But you hear what I'm saying? There's no such thing as ultimate right or wrong. That's actually an ultimate thing, isn't it? So it goes around in circles. It doesn't sound like very rational, but that's the point. There is an ultimate reality, you know, and that is that there's no sense of right or wrong because what's right for me might not be right for you. What's right for me is what's good for me. And don't tell me what's right or wrong as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else. So that means that the ultimate good is my own greed? Hmm. I think Paul might have been on to something here, you know, when he's talking about that. It's insightful, and well, if I'm honest, it's sometimes how I get off track in my own thinking, in my own living, and justify what I want to do. Paul says, but you didn't learn those kinds of things from Christ. So, what changed? What was, what changed? Paul says, instead, renew your thinking. A transformed mind. Think clearly. And I would say even to be ruthlessly honest with yourself, and that's not easy. Live on purpose. Conscious choice. We can live driven by urges. Whether it's urges to eat, urges to dominate others, urges to gather up for myself. If I can't have it, then you can't. No, Paul's saying live by conscious choice, by living on purpose, transforming your mind. Clothe yourself, he says. Put on like a coat that new person. That new person. That born again person. Jesus said something very very close to that when He said to Nicodemus, that priest who came to Him in the middle of the night because he was afraid he'd get caught, He said, you must be born again, a new person. And Paul himself said, if, any was, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. So clothe yourself with it. Clothe yourself with a new person in Christ. A conscious, on-purpose choice to be in Christ. Now, that phrase, clothe yourself, is sometimes a little bit hard for us to catch just the meaning because in English, we don't have a really good way to communicate it as well as they did in Greek. For you English teachers, it's verb tenses. The verb tense says, it was done but keeps on happening. So clothe yourself like putting on a jacket. But don't forget to zip it up and hold it up there because you need to clothe yourself with it. It's an ongoing thing. It's not a once for all. So, what was pointless thinking, no sense of right and wrong, what changed were a new person clothed in Christ. And what's the result? Well, first, first thing it affects, there should there should be or there is no need to cover up and every reason to be open and honest with each other. See, Paul said it this way. He said, get rid of lying. Speak the truth in love. See, there really are kind of like three kinds of lying. There's lying to protect yourself. Kind of cover up. 
there's lying for explicit gain so you can get something without the cost. Or there's lying to actually harm someone else. We could go into that in depth about that, what that could mean for parenting and other kinds of things, but we don't have time for that. But in the early days of Methodism, John Wesley insisted that every member be a part of a small group. If you're not an active member of one of those small groups, you couldn't be a member of the church. The small groups were called bands. And the first question at every single band meeting was, how is it with your soul? What are your gains this week? What are your struggles this week? What are your sins? Interestingly enough, up until the 1850s, being a member of one of those small groups was a requirement of being a member of a Methodist church. After the 1850s, they started to not require it anymore. And up until the 1850s, church attendance, church membership in the Methodist church continued to grow and grow and grow and grow as a percentage of the population. And after they no longer required membership in one of those small groups, it's gone down and down and down ever since. Somehow that being a part of the body, being integrated with it, is a critical thing to how we grow as a faith family. So on the flip side of that though, Almost all of the active growing churches in our country all have active, living, growing small groups. Sometimes called accountability groups. So how is it with your soul? Those meetings were a time of confession of struggles of sin, not to the priest, but to each other. You see, Paul says, get rid of lying, and lying is always a way to present yourself as something you're not. And after you've done that, he says, tell the truth to your neighbor. After that, he says, be angry without sinning. In other words, settle it quickly. Because if you don't, it's an opportunity for the devil to get in there. Be angry and sin and don't sin. Well, okay, so what is anger? Well, it's always a secondary emotion. It's emotion that follows after fear or loss or threat or frustration. And Paul's teaching us, take care of those things early. Don't let it fester. Speak the truth in love, get rid of that kind of lying and the anger will just take care of itself. And then no more stealing. Some were taking advantage of the generosity of the fellowship. And, um, you know, on the other hand, we can't take this too far because Paul also was the guy who collected a big offering to take to the church in Jerusalem while they were having a famine. So, you know, but work. Then if we read ahead to verse 29, we would also see Paul tell us to watch your language. Don't let foul words come out of your mouth. Only say what's helpful when it's needed for building up the community so that it benefits those who hear what you say. And I suspect when I read those words, it fits gossip just as well as it fits those ugly swear words that we don't use or except when we hit our thumb with a hammer or other things like that. Be kind, compassionate, forgiving each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. Pretty direct, isn't Paul? Can you imagine what might have been happening in the church there at Ephesus? I mean, it was a house church. There weren't a lot. Maybe, maybe as many as 90 or 100. But what was happening that Paul would give those kinds of instructions like, have you ever watched or observed or seen groups of people in churches, God forbid our church, where these kinds of instructions are actually needed? I mean, there in Ephesus, there might have been backbiting, you know, sniping. Um, you don't do your fair share. I didn't get what I deserved. I mean, some of them might have been passing along gossip. Whatever it might have been, 
And it would have been driven by urges and desires. The question for us is, do any of these things jump out of the dark, out of you don't even know where they came from, and jump into what we've done, what I've done, where reasoning is taken over by urges? When I bought that thing that didn't need or broke the budget or gone into debt or spoke a harsh word, and you don't even really know where it came from. It just popped out. Or you staked a claim on something you didn't even really want or need. Maybe it was a tradition, but because you truly wanted it, but because it resisted change, or because someone else wanted it, and you just wanted to have it your way. Where reasoning just takes over urges, I guess I said that backwards, where reason is taken over by urges. I know there's probably been times I've been caught in every one of those. And we have to ask forgiveness first to God and then those who've been the victim of our random urges. So the question then is, how do I, how do we go about clothing ourselves in the life of Christ with each other? Well, we set aside false fronts. We set aside lying where we can truly ask each other, how is it with your soul? Whether it be struggles with sin, struggles with selfishness, struggles with self-protection, where we can join with each other in prayer over those very same things. In our modern world, in thriving churches, those things are called accountability groups. Paul says, be angry and sin not. Settle differences quickly. So quickly that even the sun doesn't go down at the end of the day. Jesus gave really explicit instructions about solving those things. It's in Matthew 18 where Jesus said, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and correct them when you're alone together. If they listen to you, then you've won over a brother or sister. But if they won't listen, take with you one or two others so that every word may be established, so that every word may be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. But if they still won't pay attention, then report it to the church. So Jesus is saying one to one, two to one, and then a group. Now, I'm not saying to go off and do that right now. And it takes some skill to be saying things in words that communicate clearly. And and that's something else that we can do sometimes. See, but the key here that Paul is telling us is don't let stuff fester. Don't let it stay underground where it just bubbles and churns and keeps things at odds. If you have a situation that's festering or has festered, ask the Holy Spirit for direction and guidance. Seek out the help of your pastor to mend a broken relationship. Now, someone here might well be thinking, why do you even worry about this kind of stuff that Paul talks about here in Ephesians? Well, first, These are instructions from a wise man and they've just hung in there. They've been meaningful and lasted the test of time. But second, see, if you're here as much as an observer because you came with someone as a favor or because you've been curious, it's a tradition, or even just now realize as we're going through these things, you know what? I've been an observer of what it means to follow Jesus all this time. You've never actually given yourself over to Christ, to this thing called Christianity, this thing that is called being in Christ. If that's the case, then all that we're talking about is just good advice. It's good advice. It really is. It's good advice because these things are built into us by our human nature because we have the image of God built into us, and you can take or leave good advice. But it's also an invitation. It's 
also an invitation to give yourself to Christ. Holy. Maybe for the first time or maybe as a rededication. See, because if you're in Christ, a follower of Christ who gives new life, this message from Paul is life-giving. It's not just good advice. It's good news of new life in Christ. It's the life that we live today because we are sons and daughters of the living God. Sons and daughters of the living God. Let's pray. Father, Father, You've given us Jesus Christ who makes us sons and daughters of God. Lord, You've given us the teaching from the Apostle Paul that we would be the body of Christ. Each one a member of it. Each one of us needed. Oh Lord, Oh Lord, empower us, strengthen us to give ourselves to You that we would be open before You, open before our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would carry on Your name in victory and in life worth living. In all these things, we give ourselves to You. In Jesus' name, Amen.